Um, there's lots to get through with this site, so I hope I can uh, manage to rattle through it all. Um, I should also say that the uh, the two site directors, I'm here sort of on behalf of, of CFA, but the two site directors of the two phases of excavation are also here in the audience, Helena Gray and Tamlin Barton. So any kind of technical awkward questions, I'll pass over to them. Um, so here we are, we're on the outskirts of Creef, the southern part of, of the town of Creef, um, just down here where the arrow is. Um, this is a development-led project. It was funded by Perth and Ross Council and was in van advance of the construction of a new primary school. Um, and the site was a, it was a greenfield site before construction. Um, this building, this building here, for those of you that know Creef, this is the Strathern Community Campus. Um, and so there's going to be a new primary school. Well, it's, in fact, it's already being built. I don't think it's far away from being open now, in fact. So um, new primary school on that field in there. <coughs> um, so Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust um, requested a programme of archaeological work beginning with the trial trench and evaluation in 2012. So we blitzed that field with trial trenches. Um, the 2012 work led to the discovery of a small cremation cemetery, uh, which we then excavated, and the post-excavation analysis for that has, has now been completed. Um, Perth Ross Heritage Trust then requested a watching brief during the top, topsoil stripping um, during the construction of the school, as there were areas that we couldn't trench. Um, there was <coughs> gas and, and water pipes. Um, and for sort of obvious health and safety reasons, you have to leave quite large buffers around these when they're active utilities. So there was sort of zones that, um, that we hadn't been able to get trial trenches into. Um, and the hope was that these utilities hadn't destroyed everything. Um, so therefore, the, the watching brief was going to try and mop up any loose ends and catch those sorts of things. Um, so the watching brief in 2014, um, during construction, and, uh, and that uncovered a further cemetery again, which we excavated, and the post-excavation for that phase is, is nearing completion now with a, a few odds and ends. I don't have any radiocarbon dates, that's the one last thing that hasn't happened yet. The specialist work is done, um, so hopefully we'll get the radiocarbon dates off next week. Um, so this talk is going to pull together those 2012 and the 2014 results, the two cemeteries. So, 2012 excavation was quite small in scale, um, extended around evaluation trenches where we have found some cremation urns. Um, it uncovered a small early Bronze Age cremation cemetery uh, consisting of 19 individual pits cut into the natural, pretty kind of unassuming looking site. Um, here's the site plan. So, of these 19 pits, three of them, these green circled ones, um, were cremations inside cordoned urns. Um, we had a further six pits, these yellow ones, which had cremated remains just placed inside a pit, no urn at all. Uh, and this mixture of earned and unearned cremations is, is not unusual on the same cemetery for this period. Um, the remaining pits, they had nothing in them. They're harder to explain. It may be that plant truncation has removed the, the contents of the pits. Perhaps they had a different function, had nothing you know, something else inside them, not, not related to the cremation cemetery, um, something to do with the rituals going on around the cemetery, perhaps grave markers, that kind of thing. Or, I mean, the other interpretation is actually that they're completely unrelated and from a different period entirely, um, and it's just coincidence that they happen to be within the cemetery. Um, there are also some very nice finds from this trench, um, these red stars here. Uh, we've got some very nice flint and copper alloy finds, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. So, um, three urns, three collared urns uh, were found. None of them were complete. Um, you can see here how shallow the surviving remains of the pits were. Um, the pots have lost their bases due to plan damage. Um, all of the, po the pots were inverted, so they're turned upside down inside the pit. Um, so this at the bottom, the pit, that's the rim of the pot. Um, the base would have been up here somewhere and it's, and it's gone. And you can see little fragments of cremated bone inside there. Um, here's another one. And again, you can see just how shallow that is. Um, again, the rim at the bottom. Cordon urn, so you can see the cordons running around the, around the vessel. And again, the base is gone. Um, 
So these cordon urns, we'd expect them to date between about sort of 1900 and 1500 BC. Um, cordon urns mainly found in Scotland and Ireland during the Early Bronze Age, and they're probably a distinct regional form um, with links to other types of Early Bronze Age cremation vessels, such as collared urns, and they're decorated with kind of classic geometric designs. Um, of the three pots that, that we found, uh, one of the pots had the remains of two adults, uh, possibly one male, one female. Another one also contained two people, a young adult and a juvenile, um, and inside that pot there were also some cremated bones from a young sheep or goat. Mm -hmm. And the third pot had three people in it, a mature male, possibly female adult, and a juvenile, and again some cremated bones from a young sheep or goat. Um, and when I say that they're possibly male or possibly female, um, it's obviously the, the, the bone <coughs> identifications. The cremated bone, you know, you get reasonable sizes of, of pieces of bone, and the specialist needs to kind of make a judgment on, depending on which body parts you've got and the size and the, the, the morphology of the bones. And so sometimes it's you know more likely to be a male or a female, but we can't always say with absolute certainty. Um, the unearned cremations, the ones without pots, primarily just to each had a single individual in them, um, both males and females represented in those. Uh, but we had one further multiple burial identified which had as many as four people in it, at least one adult male and at least one child and one infant, um, which are quite interesting. Um, three of these cremations, including one of the earned ones, were associated with copper alloy objects. Um, these items are double-edged copper alloy razors with some more complete than others. Um, these are the drawings of those. Um, the most complete one had been protected by the cordon d'oeil and it was actually found lying on the bottom of the pit and the urn had been turned over um, and was on top of it, so it was protecting it. Either the razor has been laid at the bottom of the pit first or it was just at the very top of the pot and when the pot was flipped over it obviously ended up right at the bottom. Um, so uh, these are tanged, broad, flat, oval blades um, and on one of the tanks you can still see the, the rivet hole at the end and that would have been riveted onto some kind of an organic handle. Um, razors have been conserved, um, here they are in the flesh as it were, and, uh, and you can see more clearly the incised decoration on one of them there. Um, the, oops, the previous slide there, you can see top left, you can see the, the two sides, it's decorated on both sides, and this is incised decoration on there, um, and that's the, the close-up. Um, the razors also had sort of encrusted material on them, um, some of which has been identified as possibly being leather or textile. Um, they might be part of some kind of a sheath, um, some sort of protective covering that these razors were inside of. Um, and I should say thanks to Alison Sheridan, these photographs and the, and the specialist work on the razors has been done by her at the National Museums. Um, the razors hadn't been burnt, so they hadn't gone through the pyre with the body. Um, and objects like this would have been a prestigious item of, of personal grooming. Um, they could have been used like a razor or a small knife, and um, almost all of the razors found from the second millennium BC um, have been found in funerary contexts and are most normally associated with cordon urns. So, um, so this is yeah, very similar to the context at Broich Road, um, and often usually found with male adult males, um, which again corresponds to, to the sort of discovery at, at Broich Road. Um, and the importance of these razors, A, they're a very nice find, but B, um, we have reliable radiocarbon dates associated with them, which is uh, a, a lot of the previous discoveries have, have been sort of older discoveries and, and are not quite so reliably dated. Um, we had some other interesting finds came out of these pits. Um, here you can see just poking out the top here, um, along with bits of cremated bone. Um, we had some a, a little cache of flint barbed and tanged arrowheads, and that's them here. Um, again, these are not burnt, so they didn't go through the pyre with the body, but were deliberately buried with the cremated remains. Um, they vary in size and quality, um, specialist work done by Anne Clark. Um, and she thinks it's possible that they were made by at least three different people based on the, you know, the, the size and shape and the style of these things. Um, 
deposits of arrowheads like this, they are they are known from other cremation cemeteries containing urned cremations. So again, not massively unusual, but a, a very nice find. Um, and these came from the multiple burial. These came from the pit that had four people in it. I should point that out because that's quite a nice association. Um, some other finds that came from that same burial, that, that un unearned cremation with four people in it. These odds and ends of, of stone tools, a whetstone and a, and a cobble tool of some description. And um, so this particular pit, lots of people, lots of artefacts. Um, so that kind of stood out a bit unusual on the, on the site. Um, just quickly, these are the radiocarbon dates. Um, all of these are from cremated human bone, and they all fall very nicely within that range, 1900 to 1500 BC, which is exactly what we would have expected on the basis of the artefacts. So that was all good. It's always nice when you don't get a surprise. Um, so the 2014 excavation, following the watching brief discoveries, um, so again, another early Bronze Age uh, cemetery, and, uh, and this was obviously where construction was happening. So these guys, these are not archaeologists, these are, this is the construction crew up in the top working on the foundations for the primary school. Um, so this cemetery was a bit different. It had a variety of kists, pits, and a, a single uh, cremation on it. So this sort of overall view, um, showing this kind of, sort of almost circular layout of features. Um, got one of the kists here, you can, you can see the top of the, of the stones. Um, that's another one, and that's another one in there. Um, with these sort of large pits around the outside. Um, so here's the site plan. So again, that's sort of fairly circular. This feature at the bottom, by the way, that's just a, an agricultural furrow. That's a modern, um, modern feature. So it's roughly sort of circular arrangement of, uh, of features. Um, so we've got a single urned cremation, this one in green. We've got five stone kists here outlined in yellow, each of those containing cremations. We've got these six large oval pits running around the outside and these contain scattered cremated remains and some finds as well. Um, there's ones in blue. And a, a few other smaller features around um, the cemetery, some smaller pits containing cremations, some small pits and post holes containing nothing at all. Um, so uh, again, a, a kind of a variety of things going on. Here's the urn, this was a big urn. This was quite a big urn, this one. Um, very similar to the 2012 urns. Again, it's a, a decorated cordon urn. Again, it's inverted, so it's upside down. Again, we've lost the base of that one. Um, this has been excavated in the lab, and there was this very nice find in there. Um, this is a, a perforated stone pendant, um, sometimes called a whetstone pendant. And there, there's wear patterns around this, the hole. Um, you can see that kind of little dip on the side of the, of the perforation. Um, some sort of wear relating to how it was worn on a, on a cord or a string. Um, so that's rather nice, a bit of a surprise. It's always good when you excavate those, you never know what you're going to find in them. Um, the individual in this pot, he was a, a single middle-aged old male. Um, so five stone kists in all. Um, I'm just going to very quickly run through these, these kists because they're all a bit different from each other, all interesting in their own way. Um, this one didn't have any capstones, had been ploughed damaged along one side. So you can see the side slabs here, but there's no side slabs on this side. Um, and again, you can see that here, side slabs, and the slabs have been, have been ploughed away and they've gone. Um, deposit of cremated bone in here, and we know that this one was an adult female. And then we have the fingers of an infant, just the fingers. Um, they could be... Um, possibly not deliberately intended to be in there. It may not necessarily be that there's an infant associated with that cremation. If, you've got, if you think if you've got a pyre deposit and you've got quite a lot of bone kicking around, sometimes stray odds and ends can end up in with other people. Um, no finds at all in that kist. Second one had the capstone in place. Um, and uh, inside there, there was a deposit of cremated bone a flint blade, and we've got this whole, whole pot resting in the corner there. 
Um, this is a food vessel, so it's slightly earlier in date than the cordons that we've got on cemeteries, and uh, there's a flint knife in there as well. And we've got three individuals, remains of three individuals in here, a female, young adult, a juvenile, and an infant. Um, case three, and initially visible just as this massive capstone, it didn't look particularly exciting to be honest, there's no side slabs or anything visible. Um, but once removed, there was a kist underneath, and um, there's two episodes of, of deposition of the cremated bone in this one, separated by a layer of cobbles inside the kist. So there's material put in, a layer of cobbles, and then more cremated material in, in the top. Um, again, three individuals in here, a female, young adult, a sub-adult, sort of teenager, and a juvenile, um, and a flint scraper was, uh, was recovered from the fill. Fourth kist, this wasn't expected to be a kist at all, it doesn't look like a kist on the top. Um, it looked like it was just going to be a stone-filled pit. Um, but once these upper stones were removed, there was this massive cap stone underneath. And you can just see under there, there's, these are the side slabs of the kist underneath. So absolutely huge cap stone under there. Um, there was a bit of a, a void underneath um, when we finally got the cap stone off. Uh, and again, in this in this case, there was a, another whole pot and another another food vessel. This one was a bit crushed, but um, all of it was there. Um, unfortunately, this case, there was almost no bones surviving. There's a few fragments, so I can't tell you anything about who the people were or person because um, it's the, the pieces are not are not well preserved enough. Um, no other no other finds. Final case is the most spectacular one and it was roughly in the centre of the cemetery. Um, again, it was sort of like, looked like a large stony pit on the surface, um, but was found, this mass, again, this massive capstone um, in there. These ranging rods are a metre in length, just to give you a, sight, a sense of the scale of that. Um, and this large capstone was sitting on this layer underneath of, of flat slabs. Um, so we lifted the capstone, there's the, the slabs underneath, <coughs> Um, and once we removed those, those stones, there was another capstone under there, so double capstone. Um, again, uh, capstone was removed, and beneath that was the kist. Here's Tam lifting the capstones. This was really nice because the kist hadn't filled with stone, uh, with soil. It was so well sealed by this double capstone with the, with the slabs in between that it was just the <coughs> fresh air under there, which is always a really nice, interesting thing that happens. And with, then the piles of bone were immediately visible inside underneath that capstone. Um, the bone was almost in two piles. It looked like two separate deposits of bone. Um, our current theory is that it's possibly two bags of bone that have been sort of put inside the kist, because they're just these really nice heaps. Um, and you can imagine that this, because it was so well sealed and there was no soil in there, that this is just exactly as it had been left, you know, um, nearly 4,000 years ago. Um, so it was a real kind of <coughs> of the tomb sort of a moment. Um, these piles of bone, despite the fact that they look like two heaps, it's actually, it's actually very mixed. Um, and there are three people in here, three adults. We've got one man, one younger female and one older female in there. Um, finds an unburnt flint scraper. Um, well, that's just a bit of a close because there's two sort of heaps in there um, straight after we opened up the, the kist. Um, so we've got an unburnt flint scraper, we've got um, a burnt bone awl at the bottom there, and um, some barbed and, uh, a barbed and tanged arrowhead. Um, and that one has been burnt, that one at the top, that was picked out of the cremated material. Um, so that must have been through the pyre with the body. Um, the total depth of this pit that contained this kist and the double layers of, of capstones was about two metres from current ground level to the bottom of the kist. Absolutely massive, completely different scale um, to the other kists, really substantial feature. Um, so very interesting indeed. Um, go back briefly to the site plan. Um, again, these are the kists, that red one is, the, is that massive, massive kiss that I've just been talking about. Um, so you can see it sort of almost sits in the middle of that ring of pits. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about these ones outlined in blue, um, and then one other pair of intercutting pits 
outlined in purple at the top there. Um, so that purple one at the top, these two pits um, contain a huge amount of burnt material, um, so layers of charcoal um, towards the, I think towards the bottom of the pit, um, and a, a, a bit of a recut at the top, um, fire cracked stones, charcoal, that sort of thing. So our current working theory is that this is sort of related to the pyre deposits and the and the process of burning the bodies because there isn't any cremated material in there, um, so it's not it's not relating to the deposition of the bodies. Of course, it could be entirely unrelated. It could be a completely different date, but we'll find that one out. Um, the blue pits outlined in blue, these all have this kind of upper stony fill on the top. Um, and in some, many of the cases, it actually looked like there were slightly upstanding cairns. Um, they were certainly st sort of standing proud of the, of the natural. Um, they weren't visible above the, the topsoil and the, and the grass that was on the site beforehand, but they definitely seemed to be sort of slightly, slightly upstanding, hadn't been quite ploughed flat. Um, and there were, some of them were sort of, you know, 20, 40 centimetres in height above, above the, the, the level of the natural around them. Um, these pits contain scattered cremated bone. That's another, again, you can see that slight cairn-like quality to them. So some scattered cremated bone in these and some fines, including things like flint flakes. Um, some of them also contain burnt bone pins and, uh, and a bone bead. And that's those there. Um, burnt pins like this, these long skewer pins, are, again, are not unusual on, on early Bronze Age cremation sites. Um, they're often used to, you would imagine, for the, the, either the clothing or the shroud or the wrapping of some description around the body. Because they're burnt, they've gone through the pyre with the body and they're, they're collected up afterwards. A range of people were identified from these large pits, both male and female adults juveniles and infants, so the whole kind of range of, of people are in there. Um, like I said, the radiocarbon dates haven't been sent off yet, so I can't give you those as yet. Um, so very quickly, <coughs> we'll just put the site into, um, into its context. So just to the southeast of, of our site um, is the scheduled monument of Broyth Cursus. Um, it extended to the north under the school, so it extended up through here, that's the Strathland Community Campus in there. Uh, and an excavation happened under there by Suat in 2007, before the, before the, the campus was built. Um, and in the vicinity you've got a, a variety of other ritual and burial monuments, likely dating to the Neolithic and the, and the Bronze Age. Um, so some of these at least are likely to be contemporary with the, the cemeteries at Broich Road. Um, so it seems, it kind of looks like this, this area of the outskirts of Creef it was a fairly important centre for ritual activity over many hundreds of years. And it's always also entirely possible that the Neolithic Cursus was still visible as a monument in the landscape um, when, when the people at, at our cemetery at Broich Road were, were buried there. And it could be that these kinds of activities are deliberately being carried out close to the, to the Cursus. Um, Bronze Age burial practices. Um, so I've, as we've seen, these um, pits, pots and kists were used to receive cremated remains in the early Bronze Age. Um, they include men, women, children and infants. We've got the whole sort of spectrum represented there. Um, the items included within the, within the burials can be classed as either grave goods or pyre goods. If an object is burnt, we can assume it was on the pyre with the person, um, such as the bone pins holding shrouds and clothing. Um, other items are placed unburned alongside the cremated remains at the point of burial, such as the razors and the stone pendant. Um, it's not known, obviously, if these are made especially for burial or whether they were personal belongings going in there with the, with the individuals. Um, multiple burials, we've got quite a lot. We've got a lot of multiple burials. That is the one unusual thing about these cemeteries. There are a lot of multiples. While um, multiple burials are not unusual in the early Bronze Age, East more unusual for them to be quite so many of them on the same cemeteries. Um, it's possible that, it, as I've said earlier, that in some of the cases where an individual is represented by only a few bones, that they could have been accidentally incorporated, you know, picking up higher debris and people getting kind of mixed up and, and odds and ends being, being left behind and incorporated. Um, but many of our multiple burials do seem to be genuinely substantial parts of, of a person, um, so you can assume that, you know, 
the whole person, maybe not all of them. You, you never get, you never seem to get the entire person. <laughs> Quite common, you, or you seem to get little bits left behind. Um, so, um, so yeah, these people are buried together, and it's interesting to speculate on why. Um, what are the familial relationships between these people? When, particularly when you know, when adults are buried together, are they part of the same family, part of the same clan? Have they just happened to die at the same time? Was there an accident, disease, that sort of thing? Um, when adults are buried with juveniles or with infants, it's very easy to kind of make an assumption of a parental relationship, but again, we don't know if that is the case or not. Um, it's also tempting, as with all things archaeological, to interpret that massive central kist from the 2014 excavation as being the grave of more important people. Um, but we don't really understand the choices that are made as to why um, some people put in pits, some people put in pots, and some people put in kists, and the variation that happens also within the kists. We, you know, we don't really understand what's going on behind that. Um, so while we can't really know much of, of, of the sort of the ritual life of the people that are buried here, their relationships with each other or their position within the, the society that they come from, um, and it's hard to understand what their beliefs are surrounding life and death and the rituals that go along with that. Um, and to be honest, we don't even really understand what style of moustache or beard they have that they use the razor for. Um, but we do know that the, the artefacts and the range of burial customs, they do suggest that the people buried at Broy Craig are part of a thriving community. They're able to source raw materials um, and skilled production, possibly from within their community, possibly from, from, uh, from some distance away. So they're, they're, they're part of a rich and, and varied um, community um, and, uh, and potentially going on over some many hundreds of years. Um, so just some final thanks to um, excavation teams and specialists and the various funders who were involved in the project. And that's it. Thank you very much.